Hi, I'm Joe Klanerman, defensive coordinator at Minnesota State University. Today we're going to talk all things linebacker play. And the thing I want to emphasize is that there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, um, but we have had a great deal of success with our linebackers at Minnesota State. And I'm just going to talk about the way we do things. Uh, not that it's necessarily the right way or the only way, uh, it's just something that we've, uh, we've kind of evolved with through time and it's worked pretty well for us. First thing I want to talk about is identifying a linebacker and the characteristics that we look for in a linebacker. We have the ability to recruit. I know at the high school level you don't, but uh, there might be a, a linebacker running around with some of these characteristics that uh, is playing another position. It could actually be one of, your, one of your best three or four guys that you're going to use. Okay, the first thing that we're going to look for in a guy is the ability to run. You have to have some speed to play linebacker. It's, it's no longer a game where uh, it's three yards in a cloud of dust. I mean, these guys are going to get in space. They're going to need to cover some ground. Uh, you need guys that can move, plain and simple. Okay, second thing we're looking for is the ability to be physical. And we've had a lot of guys that could run like deer, but weren't very physical, and they didn't turn out to be good linebackers. Guys, if you want to be a good linebacker, you've got to be a guy that wants to stick his nose up in it. The next thing we're going to look for is competitive nature. We want guys that are so hungry and driven to succeed that they're going to do anything that it takes. <clears throat> and then finally we want to look for the guys that have the ability to come to balance and what I'm talking about when I say that is number one they're able to make plays in the open field like I said it's it's now a game that's uh, 53 and a third yards of width of, of a field that you need to cover didn't always used to be that way uh, that you know but the days of the big 250 pound thumper linebackers are, are about over you know we need guys that can make plays in the open field and in order to do that you need to be able to come to balance also, we need guys that can change direction, guys that can move as fast as they can move one direction and then shift their weight and get it going in the other direction ASAP. When we do find the linebackers that we like, we want to make sure they understand the rules of our culture. Okay, and it's up to the coaches to create that culture. And there's, there's really three things that we're going to be all about at Minnesota State that have, that have helped us to succeed. The first is we're going to be demanding on these guys. We're going to make sure that, that we set the bar higher uh, than they think they can achieve. Uh, really, um, you know, we talk a lot about potential at our place. I'm not interested in guys playing to their potential. I'm interested in guys that are going to play above and beyond their potential. And that's what we're trying to, to set the bar at that point. So that's where they're always aiming. The second thing is we're not going to compromise. We have things that we believe in. We have things that we know work. And we're, we're going to make sure those things get done. And we're not going to compromise our beliefs and what we do to suit some uh, individual who might have his own agenda. The third thing is we're not going to accept any excuses. We're not going to give any and we're not going to accept any. I mean, the, things are the way they are. The, they, we try to keep things as black and white as possible and we try to eliminate all the gray. And when you do that, you find that uh, your guys are a lot uh, happier and you find that your guys are going to be a lot more productive. Along with that, our, pl our players have certain expectations within our culture. Okay. First is effort. We're going to have the best effort in the nation. Now I know a lot of people say that, uh, and I don't know if a lot of people adhere to that. I guess a very simple test is turn your film on and be honest with yourself. Are your guys giving maximum effort? And that's something that we've been very pleased with. It's one of the reasons we've been very successful. Uh, the second thing is their attitude. And that's the only thing that they can control. I mean, th there's a lot of things that are outside of their control, but one of the things that they can bring every day is a positive demeanor and a positive attitude to the work that they're, gonna, that they're going to uh, undertake. Uh, we want them to be confident, we want them to play within the team, and all that stuff gets set up uh, through the culture that you create as a coach. And lastly, we want to talk about toughness, mental and physical toughness. Uh, there's not always going to be peaches and cream, and there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. Um, we make sure our guys understand that, and we make sure that they have the ability to play through that both mentally and physically. When we begin with a linebacker, we have a certain teaching progression that we, that we believe in, okay? And it really starts through six areas, okay? The first area is pre-snap things. Second area is stance. Third area is initial footwork. The fourth area is key reads and keys. The fifth area is block destruction. And the last area is tackling and finishing plays. Talking a little bit about some of these areas, pre-snap, first thing they need to understand is that alignment is critical. You know, if you're supposed to be in a 40 or a 50, 
that, that alignment has been researched by your coach, at least it should have been, uh, to the point where that is the perfect alignment for you to begin each play. And if that is uh, where your coach needs you to be, that's exactly where you need to be, not an inch off of it. And so we, we make sure that our guys understand that alignment is critical because it is a game of inches. And if you're a foot off either way, an inch off either way, you know, that could be all an offensive lineman needs to get an angle on you or all a back needs to, to make you miss in the open field. So alignment is critical. Our mic, we're a 4-3 team, and our mic will always call out the backfield sets for us. Uh, and it's important uh, sometimes for our other linebackers to hear because it might help them with their alignments based upon a backfield set. It's also important for our defensive ends and our defensive tackles to hear. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later of how that can be uh, effective. But, you know, if you've got an offset back away from you and you're a defensive end, you know, the chances of you getting a reach block are very, very slim. You know, I would tighten my alignment. And, and in, one, in a lot of these one-back things, if that back is set away from you, a lot of times the zone action is going to come to you, you know, so you can loosen your alignment. So there's a lot of different things that, that, that it helps out other people on the field, not just the linebackers. Okay, and our butt, we call our other two linebackers Buck and Will. And our Buck and Will are going to scan the line of scrimmage for anything that might look a little bit different than it usually does. Uh, differences in, in splits from the offensive lineman, heavier light hands. Uh, anything that might, that might tip those guys off. And if they see it, they're going to call it out. But we're not going to call out imaginary things. If they don't see anything, it just is what it is. Let's play ball. The next area that we're talking about is stance. And stance is an extremely important because it's going to get you started moving. Okay? One of the things, the first area with regards to our stance that we talk about is our base. We want our players to be very comfortable in the base that they select. The only thing that we, we tend to give them is we don't want their base to be narrower than their hips. We want shoulder width or wider with our base and, and any place in between there that's functional for a guy is all right with me. The, the only thing that I'm a little bit uh, fanatical about is I want our player's toes pointed straight ahead at minimum. And when you start getting duck footed that starts to inhibit your movement a little bit and it really is going to slow you down when we talk about the eight different directions of movement. What I want is I want, if possible, even those toes to be pointed a little bit inward. What that does is that keeps your knees pointed forward and it puts all the weight on the balls of your feet and allows you to move in several, in all different directions. The next thing I'm going to talk about with regards to stance is level. We want our shoulders to drop down over our toes. We want to bend at the hips, knees, and ankles. And we want to be in the same stance every single time. We will not allow fatigue to take us out of a good stance. I had a great player a couple of years ago who was a junior, just actually moved from safety to linebacker, and he had a great stance, and when he did, he was an extremely explosive player. But as the game went on and on, his fatigue started to let him take uh, him out of a good stance, and he started to become less effective. He worked on it, and then through his senior year, and he was in the same stance every time, and he ended up being an All-American great player. And I think it was uh, a little bit to do with just his pre-snap alignment and stance. The third thing we're going to talk about with regards to stance is hands. I want our guys' hands to be out and active. I don't want our guys' hands resting on the thigh pads. I don't want to give any illusion of, of fatigue or weakness in any way. I want those hands to be out and ready to strike at all times. The next area is initial footwork. We've tinkered with this over the years and gone to a lot of different things. I think we finally found something that we really, really like and really, really believe in. The way we talk about our initial footwork is we're going to key step. And all it is, very simply, is we're going to bounce in place. I'll show you some video of this in a little bit. Okay? And the principle behind it is we want to eliminate false steps, and we want to be slow to go and fast once we know. One thing I found out through time is that bad steps will take you out of plays a lot more often than good steps will get you into them. So we'll be slow to go anywhere, but once we know where we're going, we're gone. What we, try, what we try to do, and this has kind of been a work in progress, is our guys would, you know, if we had our druthers, we'd have our guys stay stationary as, as, as they deciphered what was going on. What we found is, though, if you're a linebacker and everybody's moving around you, you want to move as well. It's just human nature. Anybody would want to do the same thing. Okay? So what we had to do is we had to give them some motion without giving up any ground. And so all we, we're asking our guys to do is very simply bounce in place. And that motion is enough to keep them occupied as they see visually what their keys are telling them to do and, and where they need to go. The next area we're going to talk about is block destruction. We talk about four different ways to take on four different types of blocks. Okay? The, first, the first block is 
uh, just a zone block, an offensive lineman getting up to the second level. And when we take on these blocks, we're talking about taking them on with our hat and hands. We're going to take our inside arm and we're going to put it down the sternum of the offensive lineman with our thumb up. We're going to take our outside arm and we're going to put it on the bicep of the offensive lineman to the shade that we're trying to go to. We're then going to take the, our forehead, the crown of our head, and we're going to put it right in his clavicle. We always say hat to clavicle. Because if doing this gives us two things. Number one, it gives us power. Number two, it's going to assure that our level is lower than his level is. So that is the perfect fit that we talk about in terms of taking on an offensive lineman. <clears throat> From there, we're going to get separation. We're going to get extension. We're going to rip off into the gap that we're going to go to. The second type of block that we talk about taking on is, is a lead block or an ISO block is, is the kind of the common term there. When we take on these blocks, we, we use the term long stride through it. It's not a term that we came up with. We kind of stole it from somebody, but it's a great term. What it does is it takes your inside leg and it tells you to long stride right through that blocker that's coming to, to, coming to take you on. A common thing that, that happens to people is they'll run like gangbusters to take that block on and as soon as they're about ready to, they'll split their feet apart and they'll kind of lunge and lean into that, into that block. The best you can hope for when you take a block on like that is a stalemate. Okay, so what we're asking our guys to do is we're asking them to take their inside leg and run it through, long stride through that contact. That's going to, number one, keep you square. That's number two, going to keep you driving through that contact and you're going to get the best of that every single time. When we do long stride blocks, we want to make sure that our guys are, uh, understand if you take that block on with your head in any way, shape, or form, you're going to have big problems. So when we take that block on, we're going to make sure we take that thing on with our shoulder. The, fro the force is going to be taken on with your shoulder and still hands if possible. A third type of block destruction is something we call stick and move. The context that we would use stick and move is if we have the angle uh, to beat a block of an offensive lineman working up to us on the second level, we still want to make contact with that guy. Because a lot of times what happens if you run up into the line of scrimmage with a good angle and he runs to block you, he's just simply going to wash you out and create a bigger gap inside of you. So what we want to do is we want to run down there and with violent heavy hands, two bowling balls on our hands, we want to uh, shock that offensive lineman and then slide, move to the gap that we're responsible for. Thereby eliminating his momentum and forcing that gap to widen inside of us. The last piece of block destruction is something we call a sugar dance. This is when you're just absolutely toast, alignment's got an angle on you, which should very rarely ever happen if you've, if you've schemed correctly, but it does happen. You know, guys get bad steps, guys uh, fall down. I mean, there's a lot of different contexts when it can be used. But an offensive lineman has a good angle on you. What we're going to do is we're, as we run to him, we're going we're gonna to jive like we're going to take the run through, and then we're very simply going to get up over the top and into a pursuit angle. Hopefully, you don't ever have to use that one. There are some block destruction need to know principles that our guys just understand when, when, with regards to block destruction. Number one is space is our friend. We want to get separation from all blockers. You've got a 300 pound offensive lineman that doesn't move very well and you've got a guy that we've identified as a guy that can move, change direction and be an athlete in space. We want to get as much space as we can to, to exploit that uh, difference in athleticism between the two players. Number two is we want to out physical everyone. We don't want to dance around blocks, we want to take things on. And that's why it's important to have physical linebackers uh, in your group. Number three is don't take the easy way out. If there's an easy way and you take it, chances are you just got yourself blocked. You know, uh, offensive, player, offensive coaches are smart too. They want, to, they want to scheme you up to get best angles possible on you. And if a lineman is giving you something, you probably don't want to take it. Number four with regard to run-throughs, and every system is different. But we'll very rarely take run-throughs if they're given to us. Our, our rule is if you're going to take a run-through, you better make the play. Uh, because chances are if you're taking a run-through, you're taking somebody else's run-through. And uh, there are contexts when we will take them. But we'd rather fight through and over blocks and make plays in our gap that way. Number five is hand placement. Hand placement is critical. And like I talked about just a minute ago, we want to use sternum bicep as our guidelines for hand placement. Number six, finish and stay alive. You're never done with the play. Even if a guy's got an angle on you, you got to get off blocks, stay alive and make plays. You might make a play on the goal line that gives us another set of downs to try to stop somebody and uh, you might win the game for us that way. The next area is tackling. 
and we actually define tackling. This is again something that, that we've uh, heard from some other staffs and is a great way to describe and actually break things down and we've kind of added something to it. But we define tackling as four, four areas. Number one, the angle that you come in to tackle with. Number two is shimmy, get your body under control. Uh, we don't use the term breakdown because when a player hears the term breakdown, you just think breakdown, freeze, stop in place. And that's not what we want to do. All we want to do is, as we continue to move, get our body more and more under control. And that is the definition of shimmy. Number three, we want to work low to high. No, no big uh, earth shattering piece of advice there, but you know, we want to work from a low position and finish in a high position with our tackle. And number four, we want to throw double uppercuts. We want to make that, that is an extremely uh, big point of emphasis because we want to make sure that we're wrapping things up and finishing things through. And these four areas are huge. We, we did a study uh, a year ago, and in 12 games, we missed 119 tackles, which isn't that bad. Uh, you know, we're talking about less than 12 games, and that's special teams included. But, you know, each one of these areas, we could, we could pinpoint uh, the problems that we were having with regards to tackling. I think we missed 91 of those tackles uh, because of poor angles. And that, has, that was obviously a big point of emphasis for us into this offseason. You know, our, our angles to the ball carrier were poor. You know, I think the second biggest culprit was the lack of double uppercuts, the lack of wrapping up. There was too many guys throwing shoulders into guys, and, and it just, you know, if you don't go through the progression of angle, shimmy, low to high, double uppercuts, you're, you're going to take risks on missing a lot of tackles. There are also some tackling fundamentals that our guys have to, have to know. And, and, and I, I'm going to, just a great piece of advice that I heard many, many years ago, and we've done it every year, is the very first day, you don't even have to be in pads, but make sure you get yourself on video, on the field, explaining tackling the correct way to your guys. That's going to help out with liability issues should something ever, uh, God forbid, happen uh, with an injury to a, to a player. So um, the very first and most important principle you can talk about is tackle with your chest. Never, ever lead with your head. Secondly, you want to keep your profile, and this is with regards to angle. Where you start, you finish. So if you're an inside-out guy on the ball carrier, you need to finish inside-out. If you're an outside-in guy on the ball carrier, you need to finish outside in and hopefully I highlight some of that in the drill work that you're about to see. Number three is continue to close ground until contact is made. You don't want to ever stop and be stagnant on the football field. Keep closing to the ball carrier and, it'll, and you'll greatly enhance your ability to, uh, to make plays. Number four is wrap your arms and grab cloth, double uppercuts. Very simply uh, is, is an easier way to phrase that. Number five is drive the feet through contact and your knees through the midsection of the ball carrier. Again, a big problem is guys like to stop their feet and get drug uh, as, as they make contact. That's incorrect. You want to drive through that contact and eliminate that helmet from finishing forward. Uh, yards after contact is something that we study every year and it's gotten better and better as we've emphasized this point more and more. And number six, never get frontal on a ball carrier in the open field. When you get frontal, you allow a ball carrier to have a two-way go. Uh, you can go inside of you or outside of you. So you want to make sure that you're giving that ball carrier a one-way go and taking his uh, choices away from him by your body position. Now, as we're gonna, now we're going to tap into some drill work. And, and the big things with some of these drill works is don't just stay busy. Stay functional. You know, you should have a plan in place for everything that you want to do and what you want to accomplish. If there's things that you're not good at, you need to do drills to, to attack those things. You know, I've been around a lot of coaches that just have their kind of nest of drills that they like to do. Well, you know, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I love to get creative. I don't like to do the same things over and over and over again unless it's necessary. You know, stay functional with your drill work. And you should be able to see the fundamentals that you're doing in your drills on the film of game day. Uh, if you can't see it, then you need to find a new way to teach it. Now we're going to look at some archives of some video that we've had of ourselves doing some drills. Uh, this is not a complete library by any means, nor is it a highlight tape of drills that have been created. This is very simply days, uh, days of drill work that we've put together, uh, and you're going to see some great reps and you're going to see some poor reps, and the great thing about it is I can uh, kind of explain what to look for and some of the mistakes that will be made with some of these drills as they're in progress. Here are some illustrations of some of our guys in their stance. 
I just want to look at a couple of a uh, couple of the things here. Notice how the the knees are pointed straight forwards because the toes are slightly pigeon toed. Here's a look at them from the side here. You know, nice flat backs both ways, shoulders over the toes, great level. Here's a couple other guys doing the same thing again. Look at the toes. Everything pointed straight ahead. That's a functional stance right there now. Hands are out and ready to use them on both sides. That's what we're after with these guys. A couple of younger guys doing the same thing. Getting them taught up young here. That's exactly right. <clears throat> you know, I don't mind the fact that if I'm standing behind him, I can't see his numbers. That's not, that's not terrible. Okay. Now we're going to talk about initial footwork. Okay, we're going to talk about the key step that we were talking about just a little bit ago. I want to show you some examples of what a key step looks like. Very simply, that's it right there. The level doesn't change. He's just bouncing in place. Now it's never going to happen that long. Uh, you know, he's going to know what's going on before he gets this far in the process. You know, usually one bounce or two bounces, maybe even none. Uh, before he knows what's going on, but that's exactly what it looks like right there. Different guys have different pace. Here's another guy. You know, he doesn't, I don't want those cleats high up off the ground. They shouldn't raise up above the grass. We're just moving your weight a little bit. Just key stepping in place. That's it, right there. Just, just a little bounce. Just making sure you know where you're going before you go anywhere. That was a difficult thing to get installed. And so one of the things that, I wouldn't say it's too terribly difficult, but it, was, it wasn't, you know, it was a change from what we had been doing. And so one of the things we had to do was we had to make sure that our guys could react and we're doing what we were asking them to do, not moving before they reacted to what they see. So what we did was we stuck a coach out there and we, we would give him a, a series of, of, of things that would be stimulus for these guys to move in a bunch of different ways. They would open up and run this way, open up and run this way, backpedal, straight downhill, shuffle, shuffle, all kind of different stimuluses this guy could give. And what we were just practicing was these guys not moving uh, before they knew where they were going to. So we get them key stepping, coach gives you a stimulus, and then there you go. So I'm just key stepping, he tells me to shuffle, I shuffle. I'm key stepping, he gives me a direction, I'm open up and run in that direction. Go back to the top here and watch the key step. No wasted movement there. And we're going to see some good with some bad here too. I'll show you some, some poor examples here in just a second. You know, like I said, once you get where you're going, you don't have to key step anymore. You're wasting time. Go. <clears throat> okay, we'll jump the gun there a little bit. But this is just a bunch of different guys moving a bunch of different directions off of a stimulus. Then we, instead of using a coach, we then stuck some guys in here and, and, and we're giving a stimulus off of a back. And we're going to mirror a bunch of different back paths, you know, tight angles. You know, power angles, flare angles in, in our vernacular. And now we just got a linebacker here key stepping and reacting to what he sees off of this back. And you notice we finish a lot of our drills with uppercuts, you know, working that low to high double uppercuts. You know, you know, this is this is definitely a key step drill, but you know, along along with that, we're getting stance. You know, we're making sure guys start in a good stance every time. We're making sure guys finish. The proper way with their tackling, low to high double uppercuts. You know, there's a lot of different things that can be combined into every drill that you do, and this is a very simple thing, but it's also uh, you know uh, teaching these guys great habits all the time. So you can see we're we're working off the path of the back. It's just one key step. He knows where he's going. He goes, and there it is. <clears throat> Watch him. Just Yep, one key step. I know where I'm going. There you go. So it isn't a deal where you're key stepping four, five, six times in place and, you know, letting linemen get angles on you. You're just trying to decipher what's going on and you're not wasting space uh, while you do it. Here again, just key stepping in place. This is a, a young guy. He's a real busy guy. So this is a tough thing for him to, to, to pick up. You're gonna, I think there's some clips on here of him being... Uh, illustrating exactly what I'm talking about. So all I'm doing is I'm standing back here and I'm giving these guys an angle. The back's just very simply taking that angle and, and the linebackers are just uh, matching that angle and key stepping. 
The next thing I want to talk about is key reads. Okay. Now, I don't want to get too schematic here, but I, you know, one of the things we always talk about with our linebackers is expand your vision. That's a term that I use all the time. We want to see the, the bigger picture here. We don't want to get so locked in on a guy, whether it's a back or whether it's a guard or wh whoever it is. We don't want to get so locked in on a guy that we can't see what's going on around him. We don't want tunnel vision. Okay? I, I heard a coach explain this at a clinic. It was, it was a great, great talk. And what he said was, if you're in a dark mine, you don't want a little flashlight that's like a laser beam that can only you know, see uh, exactly what it's pointing at. You want to be wearing a big mining hat that's going to project a whole bunch of light out at 45 degree angles every single way. You want to see the bigger picture. And he's absolutely right. And that's, uh, um, you know, I use that illustration with, uh, with our guys sometimes, thanks to the coach that I stole that from. But uh, uh, all we're doing here, this is uh, something that we call a barrel drill. You don't need pads for this. Uh, there's no banging involved with this drill. But all I've done is I've stuck a barrel in here uh, that, that represents a defensive lineman. I've got a linebacker here. I've got two of my linebackers playing offensive line right here, and I've got a back. And what we're going to do is we're going to give a whole bunch of different things, uh, a whole bunch of different looks. You know, we're going to give pulls, uh, you know, block down and pull uh, one way or the other. We're going to give straight zone action. We're going to give counter steps. You know, we're going to give pass, you know, high hat looks, a lot of different things. And what we're doing is we're teaching this guy with his eyes to see the bigger picture here. He's not just looking at one guy, whether it's him or him, or you know, he, he's looking at the big picture. He's taking it all in. It really helps our young guys expand their vision uh, with their key reads, whatever your key reads might happen to be. So along with that now, we're getting good stance, you know, uh, you know good key, you know, this is also a, a great footwork drill to see that we're key stepping and not wasting movement. Okay, <laughs> I get to correct that an awful lot on, on, on this with this drill as well. So just uh, run some clips here. So this is just they're just zone action. So I know where I'm going and I just go play the zone. Okay, <clears throat> here again the new linebacker in there. See we're blocking back and pulling. He key steps. He's getting counter steps. It doesn't matter. I'm key stepping until I know where I'm going, and then I go. Okay, <clears throat> and that's where the key steps are so important. You know. Uh, you know, we, we've done it this way where you take a 45 degree step here, you know, off of the back action. You know, well, that's, that's you know, taking, that's giving this offensive tackle or whoever's coming down to target you a better angle. So we're trying to eliminate that angle uh, by keeping our depth. Okay. <clears throat> see what we've got here. Just zone action that way. You can see we're just, we're key stepping and going with the zone. Very simple. It's a very simple drill. Here's a real busy guy, okay? You see how often he key steps? Now, this is dead wrong. I don't like this at all. I told you there's going to be some bad on here, too. We're getting a hi-hat read with these guys. So you see the wasted space <coughs> and time that he takes to decipher what's going on? This is where he is. He's almost a yard ahead of where he was before he realizes that it's passed. That's, you know, a yard there and a yard back is two yards of wasted movement uh, that, uh, that we don't want. You know, be slow to go, fast once you know. Okay. Now, one of the things that I'll do then uh, to make sure that our guys aren't taking false steps is I'm actually going to take an agility bag and I'm going to put it behind their heels. And if they hit that agility bag in order to move forward, then it means they're, they're heading the wrong direction. They're wasting movement. So what we've got going on here, obviously you can't do pass with this one or you're going to have some problems. But you're going to get zone one way or the other. You're going to get, uh, you know, pullers one way or the other. <coughs> and you're showing that uh, you know that you're you know if this bag moves, you know that's a that's a, a number one indicator to him.